You are listening to Geek Fest Rants on the IC Robots Radio Network. You have located Geek Fest Rants, the entertainment podcast for genre geeks like you. Shall we play a game? Covering the world of vintage and current film and television since 2010. Game over, man. Game over. Featuring in-depth conversations on sci-fi, horror, fantasy, comics, toys, and conventions. So say we all. So say we all. And now sit back, relax, and enjoy today's show. Space, the final frontier. Science fiction is basically saying there are no limits. Space is anything we want it to be. Yes! The scale of the universe is unbelievably stunning. We are asking those big questions like, where are we going? And what does it say about us as humans? I think it answers something elemental in human beings, which is we love danger. Ah! Space travel sounds rather perilous. They will never get me onto one of those dreadful starships. Science fiction inspired the Rocketeers who brought us to the moon. And that's just the beginning. Science fiction holds out hope for even more incredible discoveries. I think we're curious in our bones about going into the galaxy. What has the galaxy ever done for you? Why would you want to say that? Because I'm one of the idiots who lives in it! Humanity is hardwired to explore. And to exploit. We are citizens of the universe. We belong there, too. Science fiction. It doesn't have all the answers, but it sure asks the big questions. What is it to be human? What if we could? Time travel. The best science fiction or cautionary tale yeah. is this world coming to an end. It's always had a social message. If you're not seeing what if, you're a fool. I'm Jim Cameron. Join me and some of the genre's greatest filmmakers, storytellers, and artists as we dig into the science fiction we love. James Cameron's Story of Science Fiction premieres Monday, April 30th at 10, only on EMC. everybody and welcome once again to Geek Fest Friends. My name is Carlos Perone and today we are going to be highlighting both a book and a television show, a limited series television show called James Cameron's Story of Science Fiction. Now in this particular case the book is a companion piece if you will to the series. The series is something that aired a few weeks ago, a few months ago, having to do with not only the history of science fiction, but some of the major players in science fiction. Uh, here, Cameron does a series of interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews, and there is also some off-camera interviews with other contributors, whether they're artists, writers, directors, technicians, uh, you, you know, actors, you name it. He kind of tries to take a, a very in-depth look at the common themes, you know, that qualify the title, you know, of the genre of science fiction. And also a book that was put out, as a, again, as a companion piece to this. We're going to look at that because it expands on some of those interviews and it kind of gives you a, a little bit of a wider perspective on some other items, you know, that technically didn't make the cut, if you will, of the actual show. So let's get started with James Cameron's Story of Science Fiction. Matu, Mirada, <laughs> You must burn the books, Montag. The books have nothing to say. When I was your age, television was called books. You, Mr. Bemis, are a reader. A, a reader? A reader. A reader of books, magazines, periodicals, newspapers. I want to talk about a book I recently read called Jane Cameron's Story of Science Fiction. Now, if this name sounds familiar, it's because this book is a companion piece to a television program that just aired on AMC pretty recently. The program itself was a six-part history, more or less, of science fiction, specifically certain science fiction topics. And the way that they broke up the show was by 
primarily interviewing certain big shot <laughs> directors and actors, you know, over this six part period. Now, the book is very interesting because it goes a little deeper into some of these interviews. Again, with a television show, you only have, you know, one hour to put out your product. And this being a cable channel, you know, a, a non-premium cable channel, there's commercial breaks. So you have to take away, you know, a certain amount of minutes from that hour. And when the time you're, it's all said and done, you're probably left with 45 minutes, maybe 50 minutes if you're lucky. So as they approach these different topics, everything gets narrowed down smaller and smaller. Now, the episodes, all six episodes, just like the book, gets broken down into aliens. And there you're highlighting Steven Spielberg interviews and his contribution to that particular subgenre. Then you have space. You have George Lucas for this particular one. Then you have monsters with Guillermo del Toro. Dark Futures. This one incorporates Christopher Nolan, Intelligent Machines, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Time Travel. Now, in the mix here, you also have Ridley Scott, featured as one of the primary contributors. And on the show, as well as the book, there are feature segments where Cameron directly interviews these different directors or actors, in the case of Schwarzenegger. But you do have other actors, pretty well-known actors and directors and other people sprinkled throughout the show, you know, that they kind of give you a little more background. Now, that you obviously don't get on the book. The book primarily focuses on those first six main individuals that contribute to the show and the additional Q&As that you get with them. So when I first watched it, it was a really, really interesting show because it kind of goes into the history of science fiction. And... You know, I've never really thought about the history of science fiction. The, the closest I've ever gotten to thinking about it is on a visual level in terms of films. If, you know, if you start going, working your way backwards into film history and you go back, back, back and you can think of, well, what could be a science fiction story? You know, I remember watching the making of The Empire Strikes Back and Mark Hamill that hosted that back in 80, 81, somewhere back then. They did a little montage of the earlier history of special effects, and it just happens that one of the earliest films was A Trip to the Moon, where it's super thick with special effects and more like magician tricks and that sort of thing. Very crude these days, but a super historically important film, you know, not only in, in the special effects field, but in science fiction in general, because that was one of the first times that you had a science fiction subject being portrayed in film. But little did I know at the time, back then or up to very recently, that if you were to break down science fiction as far as the literary part of it, for as long as people have been writing stories about science fiction, many people seem to agree that the first true science fiction story is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Now, I always thought of that as a horror movie, and it always does kind of fall under the horror Genre. I never thought of Frankenstein as a science fiction story. But when you think about it, and this is something that I'm sure people that are more into books and you know, the history of certain genres, they understand this much better than I do. And that is that, yes, the reason why Frankenstein is considered to be a science fiction story and one of the first probable science fiction stories is because... At this point, you're introducing the concept of what on the surface could be a, a monster story, a mad scientist story, you know, a horror story. But it is all based on science. And the fact that you're bringing science into it, that is what brings it into the science fiction part of it. So in other words, granted, the Frankenstein story is not a real story, because so, then it wouldn't be science fiction. Then it would be a drama. <laughs> But the fact that you're dealing with science and they're throwing science in the plot as a reason for why this monster exists, all of a sudden brings it into a new genre. Now, most of the times we, when we think of science fiction, we're thinking of other world and, you know, the future and this and that. That's true. That is very science fiction-ish. But as far as storytelling goes, you know, you already have that with the Frankenstein story. So... What then is science fiction? Well, in this book, we go through a number of different topics. 
And these topics are some of the main, I guess you could call subgenres of science fiction. Granted, there's plenty more. You know, this particular show that they put on, which was six episodes, is billed as season one, which means it is conceivable that he might do another season with other subtopics, with other guests, obviously. But just like anything else, if this was a one shot deal, these are some of the, these are some pretty heavy hitters. Now, the subject of alien life, that's an easy one in terms of, yes, that is science fiction and that is, that is as sci-fi as you get. But the interesting thing is that if you kind of start studying the history of science fiction, and I'm in the process of reading a book right now, which I actually, I found it at a Barnes and Noble discount bin, you know, the bargain bin section where you got those super cheap books. The book is called Sci-Fi Chronicles. A Visual History of the Galaxy's Greatest Science Fiction by Guy Haley. Well, this thing is about four inches thick. (laughs) It's a monster of a book. And I think it was put out maybe uh, four years ago, I would say, maybe. Maybe three years ago. And it tries to chronicle the history of science fiction in any shape or form, from literary, comics, stories, television, movies, you name it. It tries to encompass the whole thing. And... Again, it also starts off, you know, in the manner that they discuss science fiction with Frankenstein. But what's one of the interesting things about science fiction and some of these subjects is that they're not necessarily science fiction until you cross a certain line. As I mentioned before with Frankenstein, there are plenty of stories in the past. You know, I'm talking not only historically religious kind of fantastical stories. The history of man is full of those kind of stories, whether they're myth, whether they're some kind of tribal stories, ethnic stories, you know, a lot of them usually fall in the religious because whenever people traditionally can't explain something, it's religion. They just, they just kind of toss it as religion. You just have to accept it, blah, 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 walk away. But there have been stories having to do with visiting other worlds, other stars, but because a lot of times they don't involve any scientific method of getting there, they kind of fall short on the science fiction element. Same thing with time travel. There are stories out there about all of a sudden you wake up and you're in a different time. You're in the past. But because you don't explain how you got there in a scientific manner, it then does not become science fiction. It then becomes fantasy or something else or supernatural, especially with horror stories or monster stories. You know, a lot of monster stories, they're just not science fiction because there's not a science fiction element to it. You take a movie like Jaws or the story of Jaws, you know, the book is a monster. It's a pretty big monster. It's an unstoppable monster. But guess what? He's just a fish. The movie is really a drama, if you think about it, because there is no supernatural element about it. There is no fantastical element about it. This shark doesn't all of a sudden spring wings and starts flying around. No, no, that doesn't happen. You have to wait till like movies like Sharknado for that kind of stuff, I think. (laughs) But yeah, there is a certain line when you cross that all of a sudden you're dealing in a completely different genre. And there have been very, very good movies out there where all of a sudden you don't understand the genre until the last minute. Take a movie like Unbreakable. You're dealing with somebody who has these unusual abilities. But it's not until close to the end where you kind of understand where you're at in this film. Is it a fantastical film? Is it a science fiction film? You know, is it a supernatural film? And you don't know until the last minute. So that's one of the things you have to be careful with genres is that you have to, there are certain rules or certain requirements that you need. Take something like Star Wars. Star Wars could be traditionally thought of science fiction, you know, unless you dig a little deeper, you then start to realize that Star Wars is really not science fiction. Star Wars is more like science fantasy. It dips more into a fantasy world. And you're kind of being told that from the beginning of the film. The film doesn't take place in the future. The film takes place in the past. And it doesn't even take place on Earth in a galaxy. It's a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Now, when you listen to Lucas talk about Star Wars in the 
thousands and thousands of hours worth of interviews he's given in his life, he talks about how it's a it's a fantasy. You want science fiction, you go to something like 2001, A Space Odyssey. There is your meat and potatoes of science fiction. The movie is super thick with science fiction, with scientific explanations for what's happening, at least up until the end of the movie. They go out of their way to make it realistic, to make things behave in a scientific manner, especially when you're dealing with outer space, space travel, and that sort of thing. With Star Wars, it's a little different. With Star Wars, you're dealing with knights and the Force. Once you throw the Force in the mix, oh boy, now you're dealing with a pseudo-religious kind of thing that is unexplainable, but you have to kind of take it and run with it. You're dealing, like I said, knights and princesses and things like that. Subjects that are a little more traditionally out of something out of Excalibur and King Arthur. You know, it's a more traditional story you're being told. But it is wrapped in this package of aliens and space travel and futuristic looking things, uh, advanced technology. But when you really dig, dig deep, it's not science fiction. Recently, we had the death of Harlan Ellison and very prolific science fiction writer. And I've never really gone deep into his stuff. I've, I've listened to some of his panels, I believe, some of them on YouTube. I might have actually heard him once or twice in person on a convention. And he was a really interesting guy to listen to. He's, he's super, super opinionated. And one of the things that he used to always pick a fight with is the term sci-fi versus science fiction. He was very anti pop culture sci-fi as opposed to hardcore science fiction. And that's one of the things that he was always interested in is that, you know, you're writing science fiction, you're doing science fiction movies or shows, for example, and you have to portray the laws of science as much as possible. You can't just kind of write them off and say, well, yeah, that's the way it is. Deal with it. You know, there is a sense of reality that you have to bring into it that he always would talk about. And I would su definitely suggest going into that. And that isn't a really interesting individual that I would like to think that if this show ever got a second season or more, uh, they would kind of delve a little into it. Now, it's interesting that James Cameron is the person doing this show and, you know, the, the lead in this book. He's the one who's interviewing everybody, just like in the show. And one of the people that they interview is Steven Spielberg. So you kind of get to start off with a, a heavy, heavy hitter. Spielberg has had a prolific career. And he's dipped into so many genres. And every now and then, he does dip into science fiction. One of the topics that they really go heavy with him is alien life. Now, granted, why would they pick him to be the, the headliner of the alien life? Well, that's pretty simple. Close Encounters of the Third Kind, E.T., War of the Worlds. And he's dipped into other areas of science fiction with... Minority Report, if you want, like, futuristic-looking stuff. And AI, the Kubrick collaboration that he did, which, you know, that falls under robotics and stuff like that. So, you know, this guy has really, really pushed the you know, science fiction topic forward quite a bit. Jurassic Park, and most recently, Ready Player One. So, what's interesting about the interviews, and I'm not really going to go crazy in terms of what they said... But what's really, really interesting when you read the interviews, when you read the extra material that the book has, is the chemistry between Cameron and the person that he's interviewing. Spielberg comes off so direct, personal. He just seems like the type of individual that could just blend into any conversation because he's so there. You know, he's so accessible when you talk to him. And so much of his stories have to do with... You know, what's happened to him in the past, you know, childhood stories and that sort of thing. And, and he's talked about this many, many times before. And what we also find in the interviews and especially in the books is how Cameron tries to relate to whoever it is that he's interviewing. And it's pretty obvious that he's a big fan of these directors and these individuals because, you know, again, you don't get any bigger than some of these names that we're dealing with. One of the things that's interesting is they, they talk about how Spielberg used to be more of a of a true believer in alien life and how he's kind of, I think he's kind of scaled it back a little bit nowadays, or at least by, at this point in his life. 
Then you have George Lucas, the interview with George Lucas, which, you know, it's funny. I've been reading so many books about George Lucas and about his decisions and his style, his writings. And it's very, very interesting how he kind of is always, he seems to always be in a state of flux. He's always never a hundred percent sure of anything. He's always changing in a constant state of change. And that is funny because if you think about his philosophy, if you will, of filmmaking and granted his, you know, his claim to fame is Star Wars, no matter how you slice it, he's done some other successful films, a few, a very, very, very few of them. But Star Wars is his, his bread and butter. And just like in how Star Wars has morphed over the years, even through the original trilogy, how things changed, prequels, and even going into the present state of Star Wars, which he's not really responsible for. But even in his conversations, when you listen to his interviews, you see how the man is constantly adjusting and changing and adjusting and changing to everything. The interview is very well done in terms of you do get a lot of that information from Lucas having to do with how his particular genre is not science fiction. He really goes deep into his roots, which we all kind of understand them there. He's grabbing from everyone. He, they, you know, he admits that, you know, these guys are, we're just taking from everything that we've ever experienced. From Buck Rogers, from Flash Gordon, you name it. You go back into the serials, you go back into early written literary work and that's where it's all coming from that that style of of storytelling that the, that kind of pace of you know cliffhangery things happening left and right that's that's all star wars right there and one of the really interesting things that popped out not so much in the television interview but on the book it's something that popped that all of a sudden started to make its way around the internet was that lucas talks about how Originally, when he was going to do his films for the third trilogy, now whether that's true or not, in terms of uh, you know, I've I've read books that lead you to believe that he never had an intention of going to the third films. He only kind of prepped them just in order to sell his company, to make it a more attractive bundle to purchase, to have uh, certain stories already pre outlined and to lock in certain actors, obviously the, the big three, Hamill, Fisher, and Ford, to make it a more attractive package for Disney to buy. However, according to him in this interview uh, that you can read, uh, he talks about how the third films were going to be more about a microcellular world of the midichlorians. Uh, now, it was he really going to make a movie about an inner world, if you will, of, of the force and the, the wills and all that other stuff that was hinted upon many, many years ago? Or is he just pulling everyone's leg? Is he just trolling all the fanboys that didn't like <laughs> an aspect of, of the prequels? I don't know. And that's the thing about Lucas is that you really don't know. Is he, you know, he's, he, he has a very dry sense of humor. So you really don't know when he's joking or when he's being, uh, real about something. So that's a very interesting thing that came out of uh, this that all, like I said, all of a sudden it, it got into the internet and it's like Lucas's original plan was, you know, it's like, wow, that's really out there. Uh, and he, 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 I mean, he says he, everybody would have hated it. Now, again, for him to even say that sort of thing, it seems a little odd, you know, that he's willing to say it, which means, again, I don't know if he's joking or he's being for real. Now with Lucas, like I said, you do have Star Wars. Obviously you can't avoid Star Wars, but you also have THX 1138, one of his original dark, dark, dystopian science fiction films, completely science. You cannot get more science fiction than that in, in a certain way. But yeah, he does say there's a difference. You know, THX is one direction. Star Wars is a different direction. Star Wars goes more into the fantasy side of science fiction, not so much the real side of science fiction. The next section in the book is uh, Christopher Nolan. And they kind of try to go over the topic of time travel, which they do also in the show in a different episode, but they do that too. Now, for Christopher Nolan, obviously, the time travel plays very heavily on his last uh, genre film, which would have been Interstellar. Before that, he had done Inception, which it also is considered to be a sci-fi film. It's very scientific in terms of how they manipulate people's dreams. And in a certain way, you could kind of maybe say that 
his Batman trilogy. Granted, it is a comic book adaptation. And basically anything that's comic book adaptation can fall under comic book. However, in comic books, you also have that separation. And I always talk about this in terms of how Marvel does their films and how they pick their particular subjects. Uh, you know, you have the fantastical superheroes, you have the mutated superheroes, and you have your technological superheroes. So, for example, the fantastical would be like something like Doctor Strange or Thor. You know, their powers are their powers, and they're mystical, and they're supernatural. You know, they're from other worlds, let's say. You just have no explanation. You cannot define them other than they're, they're mystical. Then you have your mutated superheroes, which are your superheroes that somehow got bitten by a spider, a radioactive spider. You could say that's a little more scientific, but it has to do more with something affecting the individual that gives them these weird powers, that changes their body chemistry, let's say, as opposed to somebody who's more like a wizard that can just kind of like snap his fingers and make something happen. And his body, there's nothing unusual about it. But when you're dealing with a mutation, when you're dealing with a Hulk, when you're dealing with a Spider-Man, you know, something like that, that's a little bit, just a tiny little bit different. It starts to tippy-toe into the sci-fi side of a story because there's sometimes a scientific explanation for it. But when you're dealing with more of the mechanical, technological superhero, you're dealing with your Iron Man, you're dealing with Batman. Batman doesn't have superpowers. He's just a, like I say in the movie, he's a rich guy with a lot of money and a lot of tech. <laughs> and he can fight. So just like Tony Stark, you know, he can come up with stuff and make it happen. And he has this the, the resources to make it happen. So in a way, not only does this particular character that Nolan picked you know, to be able to do this trilogy on works on two different levels. It works as a potential sci-fi thing where because you can come up with enough technology, you can augment yourself to be able to be a crime fighter, let's say. But it also works as a dystopian theme. And that is another thing that they talk about in the book and in the show. Of these themes, the, the dystopian theme, the future that goes awry, obviously Lucas had done it, you know, in THX 1138, and it's an ongoing, ongoing subject that just continues to come at you, sometimes more than others, you know, in, in the 70s, there was all dystopian, you know, the, the Soviet Green and uh, I Am Legend, well, it was it was uh, the Omega Man back then, even with Blade Runner, for example, the, the setting is a dystopian future, you know. Those kinds of movies and, you know, when Star Wars came about, they said, all right, let's try something different. Let's not make it such a dark, depressing world. Let's make it a fun world. And, you know, that's what that was a different take on it. But with Nolan, the idea of time travel is one that really, really, really took off big, you know, with his theme coming to Interstellar. And the way that you can hear Cameron interviewing Nolan is a manner in which you can tell that these two guys are so bright. And that is the thing that really, really impressed me the most. And and how it's different in terms of how, when you look at the other interviews, when you listen and you read the other interviews, how it's a different tone. It's almost like these guys are speaking their own language. They're operating on a different level. And I hear that about Cameron. You know, granted, in this, in, in the interviews, Cameron is eventually interviewed. In the book, you know, somebody does interview him, you know, as an introduction to the whole book. But in the show, he just interacts. And because he is the host, he has a bigger responsibility than just, just, than to just spout out his own personal experiences. But he does bring it into the conversation. So he can kind of weave, you know, his, own street cred as to why he should be doing the show, which is great because he definitely belongs in the show in terms of being one of these, you know, prolific science fiction creators. But like I said, one of the things, I mean, th these guys are so connected and so kind of on the same level when it comes to trying to figure this out and talk about hard, hard sci-fi. You know, they are trying to figure it out. And Nolan talks so much about how in Interstellar, 
you know, he was trying to, you know, he, he had collaborators, physicists and, you know, experts in quantum mechanics and all kinds of stuff like that. And they were trying to be as true as possible to the reality of the science in this movie. It is hard sci-fi, even in how things should look, things that have never been witnessed. Uh, you know, they were having arguments over what it should look like and what makes it real and what doesn't make it real. So it was really, really interesting in terms of how detailed this man can get. And granted, he's not a sci-fi only kind of guy. You know, he did Dunkirk. He did one of my favorite films, Memento. He's got a ton of movies under his belt. Now, Inception was, oh my God, that was completely sci-fi. And the funny thing about Inception is that here's a movie that's a great example of how easy it is to move this movie away from the sci-fi side by turning it into more of a supernatural type of film, let's say, or a spiritual kind of film. Because if you didn't have the tech, if the movie didn't have the technology, that little suitcase and the machine that they bring about and plug on people to be able to connect them in their dreams, then you would completely suck out all of the science fiction part of the movie. The movie would look just as great if you think about it. You know, the events that take place while you're in this state would look just as real and just as amazing, except that all of a sudden now you don't have the scientific part. You could have had somebody who just kind of, I'm going to concentrate hard enough and I have enough of a concentration and, you know, I'm the guy's like, let's say he's a yoga expert or something and he can just get in your head and access your dreams. Yes, they could have gone that route. But instead, again, you make it more realistic, you make it more futuristic, a little bit, by just connecting it with a sci-fi twist. And it works perfectly. It works absolutely perfectly. And again, like I said, the, the biggest difference is that these guys are so sharp. And, and they, and you can tell that, you know, when Cameron is interviewing different people, he's kind of adjusting himself. I don't want to say to their level, but as a host, you have to not be above or below your individuals, but with Nolan, he's like right there, and they're both kind of riding that same level of intelligence, and it's really, really cool. The next subject is monsters, and for this particular one, the book goes just like the show to Guillermo del Toro. Now, I think he's an interesting pick, and from what I understand, these two have been friends for a long time, uh, del Toro and, and Cameron, and I personally, you know, I was a little confused, not confused, I was a little surprised that they would pick him, you know, to be one of these, you know, big shots all of a sudden, you know, to be considered. And I started to think about his work. And to me, his work was more horror related, horror and fantasy. I didn't really make the connection too much that he was a, a sci-fi guy. But granted, when you start to think about some of his films and you start to think about the rules of science fiction, for example, obviously Shape of Water it's a monster movie. It's a very traditional horror, if you think about it. It's a, I'm, obviously, it's a love story, too. It's a fantasy story. But I think it deals a little more in the fantasy side. Now, granted, he just won an Oscar for this thing. So something tells me that, yes, the biggest reason he's in this particular episode or the show is because of his Oscar and because of his, you know, genre cred. Now, granted, he did do... Pacific Rim, which was a perfect, perfect, you know, qualified science fiction film, a pretty big hit. He had done uh, some other films in the past, not super famous, I would say, you know, and let's not forget Blade 2 and Hellboy, especially Hellboy, because it has very scientific elements to it that kind of could push it over into the sci-fi side. Once again, you know, with superhero films, Blade might not fall so much under the sci-fi side because he's not much of a technical guy. Granted, he's got certain weapons, but with Hellboy, I think it's more implied, you know, that it is a technological environment you're dealing with. Aside from the all, you know, crazy monstery type of stuff, there is some possible heavy science and mysticism taking place. If you really think about it, you know, his, his stuff is, uh, is more in the horror genre. Even one of his first ones, Mimic, you know, it kind of, it kind of falls 
in my opinion, a little more on the on the horror side. And the Spanish speaking films that he's done before that, you know, there were definitely more on the horror side. But yes, with Pacific Rim, you know, you did bring it over the, you do go full sci-fi on him. And again, I found his interview to be a little more like on the Spielberg side in terms of a very personal, very emotionally life story driven, you know, his inspiration and how he sees things. Very different, again, than Nolan and very different than Lucas. You know, he's got more drama in him as far as what he's trying to tell in his stories. But overall, I mean, if you look at Pan's Labyrinth and some of his other stuff, yeah, it's it's more in the fantasy uh, horror side. I mean, I know he did... Uh he did a, a couple of other horror films, and they're more supernatural in terms of, um, you know, no real connection to that. But obviously, he does have a connection to how to create a monster, let's say, or how to define a monster, and who really is the monster. And yes, I mean, with The Shape of Water, even though it is more a fantastical type of film in terms of the way that it is presented and the way that you are given the reason for the monster's existence. Granted that in the film, the government is trying to scientifically explain what the monster is, but when you're all said and done, it leaves you with the unknown of you don't know what the monster is. All you can say is that it's a fairy tale kind of creature and it's, uh, you know, the natives have a reason, you know, an explanation for it, but it was not scientific, that's for sure. Plus the connection you get at the end of the film with the lead character, you know, that makes it even more fantastical. So again, I just found it a little weird and, and it almost felt kind of like, you know, he brought him in number one because of his, you know, Oscar cred. The man just won an Academy Award for his film. So he can kind of chime in on it. But I, you know, no offense, I don't see him on the same level as the previous three people that were interviewed. The next section is called Dark Futures. And in the show, it's also featured with Ridley Scott talking about some of this. Uh, now, granted, like I said before, I'll, I'll, all these directors chime in on all the subjects, more or less, if they had something to contribute. But they try to, you know, focus a little more, especially in the book. In the book, they, they kind of profile a certain subject that they want, like I'm talking about right now. At first, what they do is in chapter form, as these are divided into chapters, they have an author, or different authors, give you a brief essay on that subject and the history of that particular subject. And then it is when, in the book, we get to listen to the interview with the particular director. But on the TV show, like I said, they do profile individual directors pretty heavily per episode, but they also chime in on other subjects if they're qualified. So for Dark Futures, we have Ridley Scott. Obviously, obviously, his big thing is Alien and Blade Runner. Again, you're talking about <laughs> your building blocks. You're talking about, uh, you know, when you say something like 2001, you have to say Star Wars, and you have to say Blade Runner, and you have to say Alien. You know, uh, granted, these are all... Films that little by little feed off each other, you know, with 2001 being one of those uh, landmark films that fed the rest of them. Even a film like Planet of the Apes, you know, again, uh, you, you have this kind of thing where these are just very important events in science fiction filmmaking. Well, the thing that I found interesting about the interviews with Ridley Scott is that I always thought there was some animosity between Cameron and Scott, and I think I've could have swore that in the past, you know, when Scott would be asked about Aliens, you know, the sequel to his Alien that Cameron did, he always somewhat dismissed it a little bit in terms of how he, you know, that wasn't his thing, you know, you, you didn't really have much of an opinion on it. You know, he's always been a little miffed, I think, about the fact that after his first film, there were so many others made without his involvement, whether he wanted or not didn't matter because obviously he didn't own the rights to anything. Not until very recently did he all of a sudden get involved with making more sequels, you know, under his own banner, you know, him directing, him being in charge, which are, in my opinion, very good films. Obviously, they're not the groundbreaking, uh, you know, type of thing that we saw with the first one. But there was always this – I always felt that. There was a little – coldness about him, you know, whenever people would say, oh, well, Aliens is a much better film than, you know, they, there was always a little riff, I always felt. Now, he participated in this, he gives very good answers, and even in, you know, when you're not talking about Alien, when you're just talking about Blade Runner, you know, another one of his big, big, 
gigantic, you know, works in film. He does admit that most of this work that he had, you know, he never thought of it himself. These are all, he was a, a hired gun. He was hired director to put together somebody else's story. And obviously he contributed enormously to it, but, you know, he never really did that. And let's not forget The Martian, a huge hit for Scott, you know, in the category of science fiction. And what's also interesting that I find is that in the interviews, especially in the written ones, you can tell that Cameron is trying to either lead him to a certain place with the questions, hence the leading question, or he is trying to praise him in a certain way. He's trying to soften him up, but he either skips it or goes to another area or doesn't follow his lead. He doesn't seem to be... I mean, he's a director. He's not an actor. He can't follow the lead. So he's a different personality. I don't want to say it's a... It's an aggressive interview between the two, but it is not as warm as some of the other ones, as like Spielberg or, or Del Toro. It's very artistic because Scott's background is more of an artsy background. It is not on the level of Nolan in terms of being super, super smart. Now, he might be a super smart guy from what I understand, but he doesn't come off that way in the interview. He's very focused on what he wants to say and his personal opinion of whatever the subject is, but I didn't find him as easily warm, let's say, or personable <laughs> as with some of these other ones. So it was really, really interesting. I mean, yeah, you know, he's, he's got, he's got some really good stuff and he's, he's another guy, you know, similar to Spielberg. He doesn't just live in one genre. Then this guy hops around quite a bit, but when he does sci-fi, he does it really well. And then the final person that gets interviewed here is Arnold Schwarzenegger under the banner of intelligent machines or artificial intelligence, you know, in the show. Now, yes, this is a different kind of interview. And this is also the only actor in the group. You know, he's not a director because the rest of them are all directors. And you kind of also get the feel, like Del Toro, that Schwarzenegger is brought in, obviously because of his star power and because of his friendship with Cameron. And if you've ever heard, you know, an in-depth interview with Schwarzenegger, the man is not a polished speaker. Let's put it that way. He's not a writer. You know, he's not uh, somebody that is putting together these very thoughtful insights on things. The fact that he became a governor blows my mind that, you know, which doesn't really, uh, you know, it explains a lot of things that, <laughs> that are happening in the country now. But it is definitely his friendship with Cameron. And obviously, he is super, super iconic in the stories having to do with robots. I mean, come on, the Terminator, that's like the ideal robot of our time in terms of how realistic it became, you know, in the mid 80s, all the way through now. I mean, they're still pumping out these films. There's another one coming out soon. And I think he's even involved in it. He is very thoughtful in terms of, you know, what he can do with his character and his own particular ideas. He just doesn't present himself too well, I think, uh, when it comes to putting him on the same pedestal as these, as these other guys. Granted, these other guys are directors. Their job is to craft stories and make them entertaining and presentable. Schwarzenegger, as an actor, is only responsible for his character, and that's it. So... I'm not saying he does horrible in the interview, but you can kind of see there's this change of gears. And you can also see it again with Cameron, where he kind of slows things down a little bit for Schwarzenegger. He kind of um, he kind of answers his own questions sometimes, it seems like, you know, he presents a challenge and gives them a possible answer to that challenge. And then uh, Schwarzenegger just kind of riffs on that. Yeah, you're right. That's exactly how. Or if he has no idea how to answer a question, he says, well, that's for you to figure out. You know, you'll give an answer like that, which is typical Schwarzenegger. But this is great because I wish, I really wish they would continue with these. Again, the fact that it's called season one, as far as the AMC website says, uh, that leads me to believe that maybe they'll make a second season next year or something. And yes, they do have a lot of people they can pick from because... You know, the well is pretty rich with more directors, but I understand how getting some of these guys was very important right now because it's kind of like, well, if they never make a second season, at least they were, they were able to hit some of these giants. But I would love to see one like that. I would love to see somebody interview Cameron in the same manner in the show, even though he does have his own, you know, 
In the television show, you have the one on one interviews, you know, between the two big shots, but then you have individual comments that are made by other people, I guess, that made the interviews or somebody else off, you know, in a different setting. And they chime in, you know, writers, um, scientists, uh, other actors, you know, whatever, everybody involved in the making of this sort of thing, science fiction, chiming in. But I would love to have seen uh, somebody turn the tables on Cameron and then interview him in that same manner. I definitely recommend the show. And I definitely recommend this book because it was so cool being able to not only touch upon some of the points that were brought up in the show, but then expand on them, you know, give them those extra, you know, it's, this is kind of like outtakes. This is all the footage that was never used. Some of those questions are in here and I'm sure there's even more. I'm sure that the actual interviews went even longer than this, but obviously for, for book purposes, this is how they chose to uh, encompass it. And the cool thing about the book is that, yes, in the show, because of the limitations of time, like I mentioned in the beginning, you know, you're dealing maybe 45 minutes, maybe, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. You have to narrow it down and narrow it down and narrow it down. But here in the book, at least every chapter, you have that opening that will, through a different author, you know, a different writer, give you a brief history of that specific subject that you're talking about. And it does bring in a lot of the stuff that I mentioned earlier, having to do with the history of those subjects, the, the same manner that I found out about, uh, you know, Frankenstein being considered one of the first, if not the first actual science fiction story. And also the other one is I would definitely recommend, you know, picking up one of these, uh, Barnes and Noble books, you know, the history of science fiction and as a good companion and a good reference material, because if you ever hear somebody mention, hey, this is great, but you know, this is really based on blah, blah, blah. You look it up and you're like, that's where this is coming from. And you have it there. I'm still going through that book. I'm like only, I'm not even halfway through it. And it is just so thick with information about, you know, all these different sources and all these different mediums, you know, of science fiction and where they all came from. So I strongly recommend all of these. All right. I hope everybody enjoyed today's show. We took a look at James Cameron's story of science fiction, the television show and the book. And it was really interesting. I mean, the book itself, like I mentioned earlier, it gives you more depth into some of these interviews and not only the show, but in the book, you can also feel more of how Cameron tries successfully and moderately well <laughs> to connect with some of these individuals. There is definitely a chemistry that is either there or not completely there. I wouldn't say he completely fails on any of the interviews, but you kind of notice that he is trying to play the reporter, the unbiased reporter, but he can't kind of help his own personality come in to the actual interview itself, which is fine. You know, we all know that Cameron is not exactly a, uh, a harmless little flower. He's got his issues, too, and he's got his personality. But it is really interesting to see what happens when very powerful creative types connect you know, whether there's a spark between them or whether there is not so much of a spark. <laughs> <laughs> but overall, this was a this was a really great show. I really hope they go for a season two, because I would love to hear from some of the other people that here they might have touched on just a little tiny bit. But yeah, that they would be it would be really really interesting. And even if they made more books, you know, in other words, if they had a second season with another companion book, you know, that kind of highlights some of those things, that would be really really good. So on behalf of everybody here, thanks for listening, and we will see you soon here at Geek Fest Rents. Bye-bye, everybody. Hi, I'm Jim Cameron. Check out the companion book to AMC's Story of Science Fiction, published by Insight Editions. The book contains rare and never-before-seen concept art from my personal archive, full transcripts of interviews I did for the series with SF greats Guillermo del Toro, George Lucas, Christopher Nolan, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Ridley Scott, and Steven Spielberg. Plus, essays from noted science fiction experts on the show's key themes, including alien life, dark futures, and monsters. It's available at InsightEditions.com and wherever books are sold. This is the story of science fiction about future scenarios, but remember, we get to decide the ending. <laughs>
If you would like to subscribe to our show, send us messages, or see video links to some of the topics we talked about today, please visit our homepage at geekfestrants.com or our YouTube channel, Facebook page, or iTunes at Geekfest Rants. I don't know what we're yelling about! Geekfest Rants is produced by Carlos Perone, copyright 2018. <laughs>